the Christmas holidays among the dreaming spires in Oxford. And of course there's a panto on at the playhouse, it's Aladdin. But we're hijacking it to review the events that have made up the year in politics. There have been highs for some. Taking a risk, having a punt, having a go, that pumps me up. Lows for others. Am I tough enough? Tough enough? Hell yes, I'm tough enough. And even lower lows for a few more. If this exit poll is right, Andrew, I will publicly eat my hat on your programme. Please welcome to the stage, uh, me. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to today's show. I hope you're ready for some spills and some thrills, some drama and some disaster, because Act One is all about the general election. As the politicians hit the road after five years of coalition government, the opinion polls suggested there would be no clear winner, so it felt like there was everything to play for. It was quite exciting. The Conservatives' pitch was based on one word, security. It shows that we're a government that is on the side of people, on the side of working people, who want to get on and build a better future for themselves and their families. And our manifesto will be about securing people's future. That manifesto included things like more free childcare and extending the right to buy to tenants of housing associations, along with the odd dig at their opponents. Well, we've already seen with Mr Miliband that he'll do anything to get into power. We saw that when he fought his own brother for the leadership. Um, the danger now for Britain is that he'll cobble together some backstairs deal with the SNP, which will result in higher taxes, more borrowing and weaker defence. The problem was it seemed a bit dull. So halfway through the campaign, David Cameron rolled up his shirt sleeves and turned up the volume. And when I get the people who've got start-up loans coming into Downing Street and telling me what they've done, often giving up a well-paid career, taking a risk, having a punt, having a go, that pumps me up and it's what is changing our country. In a quieter moment, my colleague James Landale got the Prime Minister to make a startling admission. There definitely comes a time where fresh, you know, a fresh pair of eyes and fresh leadership would be good. And, and the Conservative Party has got some great people coming up. The Theresa Mays and the George Osborne's and the Boris Johnson's and the, you know, there's plenty of talent there. There's, uh, I'm surrounded by so, very so good no, people. So, you know, the full five years, but no the, third the term. Thir the third term is uh, not something I'm contemplating. Terms are like shredded weed. Two are wonderful, three might just be too many. The Labour leader, Ed Miliband's kitchen, featured as well. It turned out he has two of them. What? What did matter, whether he was up to the job of being Prime Minister. What I'm not going to do is repeat the mistakes of the 2003 Iraq war, which happened when, when Labour was in power, which is a rush to war uh, without knowing what your strategy is uh, and without being clear about what the consequences would be. I, I'm not a pacifist, so I did support action in Libya, and David Cameron uh, talked about how, how I supported action against ISIS. But am I tough enough? Are tough enough? Hell yes, I'm tough enough. Labour promised to be tough on the deficit as they unveiled their manifesto on the old Corrie set. They pledged a mansion tax and a cut in tuition fees. But it didn't seem like business was always on their side. If I've been at a dinner tonight with a number um, of business supporting Labour figures, who, th who, there'll who? be some, well, um, uh, the um, uh, Bill, um, the former chief executive of, of EDS, and I was just talking to you just a few moments former ago before chief I came over. Of of EDS, EDS. of course, who's a big supporter of ours. What's his and, name? But well, uh, to, to be honest, his surname has just gone from my head, which is a bit annoying at this time of night. People took the mickey even more when Labour unveiled what became known as the Ed Stone. Here's a cough, <laughs> Crazy photo ops were a speciality of the Lib Dem leader, Nick Clegg. When he wasn't hugging hedgehogs, he pitched himself as an honest broker in case there was a hung parliament. I believe more rather than less in the Liberal Democrat mission of spreading opportunity across the country, of getting the balance right, of creating a stronger economy and a fairer society, and I passionately believe that no other party is able to 
put that into practice in Britain today. At least he found one new fan. I learned that he's that the names live with Democrats instead of cats. I mean, that's only a small thing, but um, I learned that he's quite an honest person, Nick Clegg. I must admit because he he did he did actually say to me that he don't reckon he's going to win he's going to win this election. The UK reality TV show sometimes seemed a bit chaotic. Their leader focused on getting elected in a seat in Kent, and as usual, Nigel was Nigel. There was a little old lady on a stick, and she waited very patiently for about ten minutes to talk to me. So I went over and said hello, and she said, "It's my birthday today." I said, "Oh, great!" I said, "Can I ask?" How old you are? And she said, 95. And I said, well, happy birthday. And she kissed me on the lips and said, are we going out tonight? <laughs> I won't ever forget that as long as I live. The leader of the Greens made waves with a terrible radio interview that led to an infamous new phrase, brain fade. We're looking at a total spend of 2.7 billion. But what is the total cost of 500,000 homes? Um, I didn't do a great job this morning, uh, I had a brain fade, that happens. What I'm aiming to do is to face up to that and then move on. Yes. But it didn't seem to bother the thousands of new members who signed up to her party. And now the action moves to the not so far away magical land of Scotland. It's ruled by Nicola, the selfie queen, who even granted me an audience. Buttons not working. Oh yeah, there it we is. We got one. The SNP lost the independence referendum in 2014, but Sturgeon's been surging ever since, and she made it clear she wanted her party to hold the balance at Westminster. If there are more anti-Tory MPs in the House of Commons than Tory MPs, then if we work together, we can lock David Cameron out of Downing Street. And then in terms of the influence that the SNP on Scotland's behalf could have, that doesn't all come down to a Queen's speech. It's about the influence you the exert individual. across the lifetime of a parliament. And with the Fixed Term Parliaments Act now in place, it is possible to change the direction of a government on individual issues without bringing that government down. That puts a party like the SNP, if we have that influence, into a very, very strong and powerful position. <laughs> Music to the ears of the Conservatives, who said that a Prime Minister, Ed Miliband, would be held ransom by Scottish nationalists like Alex Salmond. They rammed the message home again and again and again. Well, the election is coming down to a very clear choice. You either stick with the Conservatives, who've got a competent long-term plan that's getting the country back to work and cutting people's taxes, or you risk a weak Ed Miliband being pushed around by Nicola Sturgeon. It was a nightmare for the Labour leader, who had to rule out a deal with the SNP in pretty much every single interview. People who are thinking of yeah. which way to vote need to know and I'll tell exactly, them, and I'll tell them a Labour government led by me, what happens in that Labour government will be decided by me, not by the SNP. We're not going to have a coalition with the Scottish National Party. I'll let other people talk about coalitions and deals and all of that. I'm not getting into that talk. All of our protagonists met for a debate on ITV, but it was two supporting characters who stole the show, Nigel Farage with comments like this. You can come into Britain from anywhere in the world and get diagnosed with HIV and get the retroviral drugs that cost up to £25,000 per year per patient. And Leanne Wood, leader of Plaid Cymru, with smackdowns like this. This kind of scaremongering no, rhetoric it's a fact. is dangerous. It's, a fact. it's dangerous, it divides well, communities, true. and it creates <laughs> stigma to people who are ill. And I think you no, ought to doesn't. be ashamed of yourself. Well, I'm sorry, we've got to put our own people first. <laughs> then, on May the 7th, the nation went out to vote. And we all held our breath until 10 pm. But here it is, 10 o'clock, and we are saying the Conservatives are the largest party. And here are the figures which we have. Quite remarkable, this exit poll. The Conservatives on 316. That's up nine since the last election in 2010. Ed Miliband for Labour. 77 behind him at 239, down 19 
from the last election. I was in that studio when the exit poll was broadcast, and it came as quite a shock. But it was, broadly, right. Labour suffered its worst general election result for a generation. Right, let's put down seat number 248. That's the Labour hold in Feltham and Heston, just outside London. But the real story of the night is here in Scotland and the SNP sweep. The SNP went on to win all but three seats north of the border. Then there were the Lib Dems. If this exit poll is anywhere near right, this is beyond your worst nightmares. If this exit poll is right, Andrew, I will publicly eat my hat on your programme. Have you got a hat? Uh, no, but I'll get one, especially for the... Can occasion. I get the hat? Paddy would have to get munching because the Lib Dems did even worse, ending up with just eight members of parliament. Nigel Farage failed to become an MP and UKIP ended up with just one, despite getting four million votes nationwide. And the Tories held on to key seats like Nuneaton, defying all the predictions to win. David Cameron swept into Downing Street the next day. Afternoon, Prime Minister. To usher in the first Conservative majority government for 18 years. Everything I've seen over the last five years, and indeed during this election campaign, has proved once again that this is a country with unrivaled skills and creativeness. A country with such good humour and such great compassion. And I'm convinced that if we draw on all of this, then we can take these islands with our proud history and build an even prouder future. Together, we can make Great Britain greater still. Thank you. What would David Cameron do in his second term as Prime Minister? And what would it mean for everyone else? Well, that cliffhanger is where we're going to leave Act One. I don't know about you, but I'm heading to the bar for an interval drink. Oh, and we're going to say goodbye to some pretty major characters. The morning after the election, Ed Miliband told party workers that he was off, triggering a leadership contest. I am truly sorry I did not succeed. I've done my best for nearly five years. Now you need to show your responsibility. Your responsibility, not simply to mourn our defeat, but to pick yourself up and continue the fight. The Shadow Chancellor Ed Balls was among the Labour big beasts who lost their seats. Their Scottish leader Jim Murphy quit to spend more time on his basketball skills. Well, not really. And Harriet Harman stood down after eight years as the party's deputy leader, so no more standing in at PMQs. 28 years on the front bench, you're going to miss it. No, I just feel a massive relief, really, because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's such a responsibility and now somebody else can do it and I shall loyally support them. There were tears among Lib Dems as Nick Clegg announced his departure as leader. Clearly the results have been immeasurably more crushing and unkind than I could ever have feared. For that, of course, I must take responsibility and therefore I announce that I will be resigning as leader of the Liberal Democrats. Tim Farron was elected as his replacement. Tributes were paid to another former Lib Dem leader, Charles Kennedy, who lost his battle with alcoholism. The former Home Secretary, Leon Britton, died before the police decided not to pursue claims of sexual abuse. Labour veteran Dennis Healy died at the age of 98. And we said goodbye to Geoffrey Howe, the loyal deputy who helped to bring down Thatcher. It's rather like sending your opening batsman to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. <laughs> at the seaside, Nigel Farage announced his resignation as UKIP leader. But I'm a man of my word. I don't break my word. So I should be writing uh, to the UK uh, UKIP National Executive in a few minutes, uh, saying that I am standing down. And in Northern Ireland, Peter Robinson said he was resigning as First Minister. Welcome back to Act Two. Remember, the Conservatives have surprised everyone by winning the election and forming a majority government, while quite a few characters have left the stage. But who is UKIP's new leader? He's behind you! Pardon? He's, He's behind, behind you. you! Oh, no, he isn't. 
Oh, oh yes, yes, he is. is. Oh, yeah, he is. No, UKIP couldn't live without him, although Nigel's return sparked a mini meltdown among his team. I think he's had people around him who've not only got, as I say, an American Tea Party type political agenda themselves, but are also intoxicated with the tactics, perhaps, of the right wing of the American Republican Party, which is very much about attack and aggression. Uh, and I don't think that works in British politics. I don't think British voters are attracted to it. And I don't think it allows Nigel to show the best of himself to the British public. Labour had a real leadership contest, which you might have heard about. Critics said she was too right-wing, that he was too meh, and that she got her mojo too late in the campaign. And none of them could compete with Jeremy Corbyn. An MP since 1983, very left-wing and fond of homemade jumpers. Is uh, that the jumper that your mum made? Yes, it is. Thousands of new activists paid £3 to sign up to the party and propel him During to the leadership. During this amazing three months, our party has changed. We've grown enormously. We've grown enormously because of the hopes of so many ordinary people for a different Britain, a better, a better Britain, a more equal Britain, a more decent Britain. They're fed up with the inequality, the injustice, the unnecessary poverty. All those issues have brought people in, in a spirit of hope and optimism. But where to start? The clothes? His well-read shadow chancellor? To assist Comrade Osborne in his dealings with his newfound comrades, I brought him along Mao's little red book. <laughs> His opposition to the police shooting terrorists. So you tweeted, please tell me it's not true Jeremy has just said that faced with a Kalashnikov wielding genocidal fascist, our security forces should not shoot. Why did you tweet that? Because I, along with millions of Labour voters in the country, were very concerned by the interview that Jeremy gave. Or how about the fact that in Corbyn's shadow cabinet, it's OK to disagree, even on very big things like nuclear weapons. Would you ever push the nuclear button if you were Prime Minister? I am opposed to nuclear weapons. I am opposed to the holding and the usage of nuclear weapons. They're an ultimate weapon of mass destruction that can only kill millions of civilians if ever used. I don't think that answering a potential Prime Minister, answering a question like that, uh, is, is in the way in which he did is helpful. If you've got a nuclear deterrent, you've got to be willing to use it in extreme circumstances or it isn't a deterrent. You should never say never in politics because what you need to do is uh, look at the circumstances that arise, the evidence before you. In the wake of the Paris terror attacks, when MPs debated whether to attack so-called Islamic State in Syria, the splits in Labour got serious. Go to bombing, go to war! Jeremy Corbyn was on the side of the anti-war protesters, his shadow foreign secretary in favour of military action, sort of potential new leader-in-waiting in favour. And we are here faced by fascists. Not just their calculated brutality, but their belief that they are superior to every single one of us in this chamber tonight and all of the people that we represent. They hold us in contempt. They hold our values in contempt. They hold our belief in tolerance and decency in contempt. They hold our democracy, the means by which we will make our decision tonight, in contempt. The airstrikes went ahead, with British forces hitting oil fields held by IS in Syria, alongside targets in Iraq. When it comes to other weapons, like the ones used at the government eavesdropping post GCHQ, there was new legislation to help the spooks catch the baddies. If it's Tuesday, it must be Bulgaria. David Cameron continued his never-ending tour of European leaders as he tried to convince them that Britain needs a new deal from the EU. It was all happening against the backdrop of the continent's migration crisis. David Cameron promised to take 20,000 Syrian refugees from camps outside the EU. 
back at home, his chancellor carried on trying to build that northern powerhouse. A plan to electrify the railway between London and Sheffield was stopped, then restarted. Also shunted into a siding, George Osborne's plan to cut tax credits, postponed after a baroness went ballistic. Basically, what this does is undermine the fair contract we had with people when we said, with tax credits, we will make work pay. Now, what's going to happen if there is no delay tonight, then this will become, these cuts will become law. And at Christmas, families will get letters saying that they will lose £1,300 a year. Although, at the Conservative government's first budget in the summer, Osborne won plaudits with this surprise announcement. I am today introducing a new national living wage. We will set it to reach £9 an hour by 2020. The new national living wage will be compulsory. Working people aged 25 and over will receive it. It will start next April at the rate of £7.20. The Low Pay Commission will recommend future rises that achieve the government's objective of reaching Elsewhere at Westminster, I had to learn the faces of a lot of new MPs. Guys, you're, you're not new MPs, are you? No. I'm afraid I don't know your name. Anne McLaughlin. Nice to meet you, Anne. How does it feel settling in? Uh, no, it's great. It's great. Every, all the Parliament staff have been fantastic. I didn't realise when I got here that you can't use cash on London buses, so I got told to get off the bus. Very politely, I have to say. The SNP newbies got into trouble for breaking rules in the chamber. Order! 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 Can I say at the start of the Parliament that the convention that we don't clap in this chamber is very, very, very long established and widely respected? And it would be appreciated if members would show some respect for that convention. One really stood out though, the youngest MP for years, Mary Black, 20 years old when she took up her seat in May. Now the government, quite rightly, pays for me through taxpayers' money to be able to live in London whilst I serve my constituents. My housing is subsidised by the taxpayer. Now the Chancellor in his budget said, it is not fair that families earning over £40,000 in London should have their rents paid for by other working people. But it is okay so long as you're an MP. Yeah, <laughs> in this budget, the Chancellor also abolished any housing benefit for anyone below the age of 21. So we are now in the ridiculous situation whereby, because I am an MP, not only am I the youngest, but I am now also the only 20-year-old in the whole of the UK that the Chancellor is prepared to help with housing. Who is our secret Santa? And finally, who is the secret Santa in this footage that's recently been unearthed? Would you like to reveal yourself? Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, I need the beard. Well done, Jeremy. I thought it was the real Santa. Pies all round. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Don't mind the Thank you very much. While the mid Yes, it's the new Labour leader, the man who really has stolen the show this year. And so the curtain falls on 2015. What a year for politics. There's going to be plenty more in 2016, like elections to the Scottish Parliament. How will the SNP do? Will Labour or the Conservatives be the second party north of the border? Sir John Chilcott's going to publish his report into the Iraq war six years after his inquiry first started. And there's a good chance we'll all be voting in a referendum on whether Britain should remain a member of the European Union, possibly one of the biggest political moments, certainly in my lifetime. I'll see you then. What a good show.